Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer portion of today's call. At that time, you may press star 1 to ask a question. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Janice Wingo with the International Trade Administration. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Good morning to people who are in Hong Kong. Today, we are very lucky to have Charmaine Koo, who is a partner with Deakins in Hong Kong, speaking to us about parallel imports into Hong Kong. Um, at, the end of the, at the end of the presentation, Charmaine has graciously um, been so gracious as to be able to say that she would answer our questions. And anyone who is listening on the audio recording, Charmaine also said that you could um, email her with questions. Just to give you a little bit of background about Charmaine, she is a partner at Deakins in Hong Kong. She's admitted in Hong Kong, England, and Wales, and she's also admitted to practice law in Ontario, Canada. She specializes in intellectual property law, um, particularly litigation and commercial exploitation of intellectual property rights. She has a specialization in entertainment law, um, as well as extensive experience advising in the film, music, and publishing industry. Of course, she has litigation experience on parallel imports in Hong Kong, and we look forward to hearing her expertise on this area. Um, Charmaine? Yes. Oh, oh thank you, Janet. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me today. Um, uh, parallel imports, obviously, is a very interesting topic because unlike um, counterfeits, it's much more of a gray area, but obviously it doesn't cause any less of a concern to uh, owners of rights. Um, obviously, for, for owners, it's a loss of control of their products and how they would like their products to be distributed. Um, very often, parallel imported uh, products are offered at a lower price as well, and then owners are uncertain about the, quant uh, the quality of the goods. And obviously, one of the most important things is that exclusive distributors are often very upset about this because, you know, they've paid money, um, spent money on advertising, and got exclusive rights to distribute in a certain country, and then other people start importing um, the same products and selling them at a lower price. So this is definitely an area of great concern to, um, to owners of rights. Um, well, as I mentioned, this is actually quite a complicated area because because the goods are actually genuine goods of the owners. So it is very different from when it's counterfeit. And as we all know, in many, many countries, the concept of international exhaustion of rights apply, which means that once the goods are put into the market, they are deemed to be you know, put on the market with the consent of the owners, and therefore often um, there's not much that you can do about this. Um, well, in Hong Kong, the law is very, very complicated. So what I'm going to go uh, to do today is to have a very brief review of the applicable IP laws, and then I'll give some tips um, as to how to prevent uh, uh, parallel imports in Hong Kong. Well, in my, in my years of practice, I have uh, dealt with many, many uh, owners in many different industries, including in the cosmetics industries, music, film, electronics, fashion, and even in cars like automobile industry, and they are all affected by the parallel imports issues. And I'm sure that a lot of you have noticed that there are actually a lot of Internet websites um, selling parallel imported goods, and in fact, many of them originate from Hong Kong. Um, I must confess that I've also advised on website owners as well as to whether or not they are allowed to... Um, sell parallel imported goods on, on the Internet. So this is, you know, really an interesting area where both sides have equal arguments. So let's go into the laws in Hong Kong. First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the trademark law. Well, under Hong Kong trademark law, there is actually a specific provision that deals with parallel imports. In fact, the law says that it is not an infringement if you are using the mark to identify the genuine goods of a, a trademark owner. Um, in particular, the law says that if the owner puts their goods anywhere in the world, so anywhere in the world, not just in Hong Kong, as long as it's put in the market, on the market by or with the consent of the owner. And what I didn't put in the slides is that the consent can actually be expressed or implied. So you don't have to explicitly say that I consent to you know, the goods as long as there's you know, action that implies that there's consent. That's already good enough. Further, um, it also says that the consent can be conditional or unconditional. So even if you put some conditions on the consent, so for example, you say that, oh, um, I only consent to you selling in the United States, um, that might not help because we, the law says that as long as there's consent, even if it's conditional, the, the rights have still been exhausted. 
So it is very clear from the trademark laws in Hong Kong that, you know, there is a specific provision saying that as long as the goods are put on the market anywhere in the world with the consent of the owner, then their rights have exhausted. So they can't stop people from, you know, continuing on to sell the goods in, in other countries. Well, in Hong Kong. There are, however, some exceptions. The exceptions are that, first of all, if the conditions of the goods have changed or have been impaired, and it is detrimental to the distinctive character and repute of the trademark if you sell the parallel imported goods, then that is an exception to the allowance that I've just mentioned above. So the question is, what do we mean by conditions of goods have impaired? And I've actually gone into this in great detail for a lot of our, our clients because, you know, this is the key to whether or not they can stop parallel input. Um, there are some obvious situations, for example, if the goods are rejects or they are defective or, you know, they are seconds. Um, the, the owners have actually, you know, inspected the goods and decided that, oh, there's something wrong with the goods, um, they're defective and therefore I don't want to sell them. Then there's a much, you know, stronger case to say that the condition of the goods have, have changed or deteriorated because they, you know, it's not the goods that they have, you know, allowed to be put on the market in the first place. Um, in some situations, conditions actually have deteriorated after they've been put on the market. So, for example, when we're talking about cosmetics, um, when the owner puts them onto the market, it could be, you know, under a certain condition, but then subsequently, because of the shipping conditions on the, or the storage conditions, the conditions could have changed. So, for example, if we're talking about cosmetics and creams, maybe they need to be, you know, stored in a certain temperature or certain conditions, and if the shipping or transportation is not done in a way that's controlled, then it could be that the conditions of the goods have actually deteriorated. So that, those are actually the more straightforward situations where you can prove that the goods, you know, the conditions have changed. A more interesting question is what about packaging? You know, what if the packaging has been changed? Would that be considered part of the goods that have, you know, the, the condition of the goods have changed? Um, there aren't any specific case law on point in Hong Kong, but we can gather from cases in other countries that there is an argument, you know, for or against. And one of the things that, you know, people, you know, courts will consider is whether the packaging is a material factor for consumers when they're deciding to purchase something. So as an example, for example, if we're talking about cosmetics, obviously, you know, in packaging is a big part of cosmetics, so you are buying perfume often because of the bottle or because how beautifully it's packaged and, you know, it, 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 they all come together to give value to the product and to, you know, induce people to buy your product or not. Whereas, you know, on the other hand, shoes, the packaging of the shoes, the box that it comes in or the tissue paper that it's wrapped in is much less of a consideration for people. So, so in, in this, you know, contrasting situation, perhaps if the packaging for shoes has been, you know, changed or impaired, it may not be considered um, a change of conditions of the goods, whereas if the packaging of cosmetics have been changed, then it may be. So it depends on the facts of the case. And one of the interesting, you know, situations that we come across a lot is, uh, you know, people changing the packaging by putting uh, stickers on it with local language or to comply with local requirements. So, for example, you know, most countries have labeling requirements to, you know, require you to put in certain information in the local language. So with a lot of parallel imports, we see that there will be stickers put on um, which would comply with the local with law requirements. Um, our view is that, you know, and, and we've seen some cases in other countries that just putting on a sticker is probably not good enough to say that there's been a change of condition uh, or impairment of the condition of goods because it's stuck on the packaging itself and it doesn't really, you know, change, impair the conditions of the goods itself. So, and then, you know, going on, the second requirement is that the change must be detrimental to the repute of of the uh, trademark owner. So as I mentioned just now, if, you know, you stick on a sticker uh, that complies with local uh, local labeling requirements, I think it would be quite difficult to argue that putting on the sticker is detrimental to the repute of, uh, of the owner because I would think that, you know, even for genuinely authorized local imports of the goods, often they would have to comply with the same thing and they might have a sticker on it um, that complies with local law. Um, another situation that we see quite a lot is when the barcode is, is scraped off 
from the or scratched off from the packaging. Well, the reason obviously is because very often the barcode will tell the owner where the products come from, and the owners can go after the you know the rogue manufacturer or distributor who are selling uh, the products you know in breach of their license agreement. So very often we see uh, parallel imported products where the barcode is scratched off. So again, you know, does that equate to changing of the conditions of the goods or an impairment of the goods, I think, again, it depends on the situation. So, for example, if the barcode is just on the packaging and it's very small on the side, if you've scratched it off, arguably the condition of the goods have not been impaired, so we wouldn't be able to fall within the exception. However, if the barcode is actually on the product itself, so you can imagine if the barcode or the, the uh, serial number or something like that is on the, on the camera itself and you scratch it off, then I would say that there's a, you know, much stronger argument that the condition of the goods have actually been impaired, and it would be detrimental to the uh, repute of the of the trademark owner. Um, there are other con other things that we could consider arguing as well. Uh, for example, you know, with parallel imported goods, very often the warranty is void. Um, there's no quality control uh, as to you know with respect to these goods. Would those be considered detrimental to the repute of the owner? I think that's certainly arguments that we can we can raise. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any case law on point in Hong Kong, so it's you know it's not absolutely certain one way or the other. But these are certainly arguments that we often try to raise in in support of you know prohibiting uh, certain parallel imported goods. So moving on, um, the next area of law which is very useful and or applicable is copyright law. Um, under Hong Kong copyright law, under the definition of what an infringing copy is, parallel import products are actually included. So parallel imported products can be considered an infringing copy of a copyright work. And, but however, the conditions are actually quite specific. It doesn't just say all parallel imported goods are infringing copies. The conditions are that it has to be imported into Hong Kong, and the making of that product in Hong Kong has to be an infringement, or it has to be a breach of an exclusive license agreement. So for those of us who are familiar with parallel imports or how goods are being distributed um, around the world, we know that very often owners do appoint exclusive licensees or exclusive manufacturers for products in different parts of the world. So if, you, if the owner actually has in place these kind of exclusive agreements, then there's an argument that these parallel imported products would be considered an infringing copy of a copyright work because they will be in breach of an exclusive license agreement. However, I also see that there are a lot of situations where owners don't have an exclusive license agreement or they have a license agreement, but in the agreement it doesn't make it that exclusive, right? So for example, um, in order to fall within the first condition, which is that making of the product in Hong Kong is an infringement, it basically means that you have to have um, in the manufacturing agreement that the manufacturer must only make in, for example, the United States, and they cannot make the products in, say, Hong Kong. Because only if you have that condition in the agreement can you then argue that the making of that parallel imported product in Hong Kong would be an infringement or would be an, a breach of an exclusive license agreement. So this actually requires the owner to have in place very specifically worded agreements um, in order for us to even begin to argue that a parallel imported product is an infringement of copyright in Hong Kong. So following on to that, if a parallel imported product is in breach of these conditions, then it actually is infringement in Hong Kong. It attracts civil liability, but it also attracts criminal liability. However, the criminal liability is much more limited because it only applies to importation of a parallel imported copy within 15 months of the first date of publication. So this is, this is very odd, and it, it is the way it is because um, when we were taught, discussing about amendments to the copyright law in Hong Kong. Obviously, there's very, very strong lobbying from both sides. 
right? The copyright owners are trying to lobby for much stronger protection against parallel imports. But on the other hand, the retailers, you know, and the users are, are advocating for, you know, no control over parallel imports because they think that, you know, they should be able to access the cheapest products that they could get their hands on. And then very often uh, with the more obscure products, they are not even available in Hong Kong. So the only way that they could buy, for example, some more obscure music or books is from parallel importers. So because of arguments from both sides, Hong Kong has come to this sort of what they consider as a middle ground. So it's only criminal offense if it is a very new product. So if, if it's only, you know, within the 15 months of first date of publication anywhere in the world. So if it's a new movie, within 15 months, if you import it into Hong Kong, it's criminal offense. But after 50 months, you can still sue them under copyright law uh, as, as, as a civil liability, but it's no longer criminal. So this is sort of a, a you know, a halfway house to try to please both parties. Uh, moving on. I mean, obviously, under, even under copyright law, there are exceptions as well. So, for example, the copyright provisions against parallel imports do not apply to what we call accessory works. So accessory works are basically packagings, instructions, labels. Um, so this is very interesting because we have been asked to advise on uh, one of the cases where in Hong Kong it's very, very common to have these cosmetic sellers, big, big chain store cosmetic sellers that sells every brand of cosmetics and they are not authorized dealers. And one of these companies were, you know, was listed in Hong Kong uh, uh, at a period of time and I was asked to advise on that. And the reason why they could list a company that only sells parallel imports is because they're selling cosmetics. And if we think about it, you know, what is protected by copyright in a, in a jar of cream? The cream itself is not protected by copyright because it's not a copyright work. It's the packaging. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the box, um, the bottle. That's the copyright work because it's a design of, you know, uh, some aesthetic value or whatever. That's the copyright work. But our copyright law specifically excludes accessory work from the parallel imports provisions. So that's why, you know, you can't use the parallel import copyright provisions to stop something like cosmetics because the only copyright there is is in the packaging and instructions and labels and that's specifically excluded. Another area that's excluded is computer programs um, because it's a very long story but basically uh, in, in Hong Kong uh, using uh, parallel imported or using computer programs even as part of your business, which is not authorized as a criminal offense. So again, as a halfway house to appease businesses and everything, um, the law has now changed to say that you can use parallel imported computer programs. So this is again a halfway house to appease businesses because they're saying that, you know, computer programs are so expensive and you're making a criminal offense for us to use, you know, uh, unauthorized copy in our business. So, you know, we want to at least be able to use parallel imported copies. So the law has now changed to say that, okay, for computer programs, the parallel imported prohibitions doesn't apply. So that, again, is excluded. Um, obviously, you know, uh, for for criminal offense in particular, if you have no knowledge or no reason to believe that a copy is infringing, then then it's also not an infringement. So I think with parallel imports, it's particularly difficult because very often parallel imports copies, they look like, I mean, they are genuine copies. So it's very difficult for consumers or for people to tell whether they are authorized copies or whether they are parallel imported copies. It's not that easy to tell sometimes. So that's why there is also this exception that if it's, you know, if you don't know that it is and there's no reason to believe that it is actually a parallel imported copy, um, then it won't be, um, it won't be, you know, an, an offense or a liability either. Um, it's interesting because then the law goes on to give a lot of exceptions to show how, uh, you, know, you know, if the owner has acted unconscionably, it's also, you know, you would also have a defense. So, and, and the list goes on and on. So some of the things that they would consider is that, for example, if you approach the owner or the exclusive licensee to say that I want to import these books or music or film into Hong Kong, and then they say, I, sorry, I won't grant you a license, or I would grant you a license on these ridiculous terms, then you could say, hey, I've asked them, and they've acted unconscionably, so I'm just going to parallel import them, and, and then, you know, it will be an exception under the copyright law. So, again, these are all put in to try to balance the rights between users and, you know, businesses, and also the rights of the owners. So, whilst the law provides some way for, for owners to stop parallel imports, they also require them to act 
in a, you know, a conscionable way. So they won't withhold supply on unreasonable terms, et cetera. Um, so it, it's uh, aiming to strike a balance between the two. So, but what this means is that, is that it makes the position very unclear because very often people would come to me and say, oh, these people are parallel importing um, uh, music or clothing or uh, books and can I do something about it? And then I would need to go into the copyright law and say, yes, you know, under the copyright law, parallel imports can be infringement. However, we must first of all show that you have in place these exclusive license agreements or exclusive manufacturing agreements so that we could show that the making of that copy in Hong Kong is infringement or it's a breach of an exclusive license. And then I would need to say, oh, by the way, did they ever approach you to ask for a, a right to uh, um, import and then you have refused them or you've, you know, only allowed them to import on ridiculous terms? Because if you have and they have approached you, they've asked for you, uh, you know, they've approached you and you didn't reply to them or something like that, then they might have a defense as well. So, so as you can see, it, it's very, very complicated. But on the other hand, certainly I have assisted clients in the film and music industry to write to, you know, very big retailers and ask them, you know, to stop parallel importing uh, certain films and music. And then once they've received the letter, they have stopped. So it, it can be effective, but then it is the position is very complicated. Okay, another area that um, has actually been successfully used to stop um, parallel imports is passing off. Um, I, don't, I, I think passing off is not a concept that's available in, in you know, some jurisdictions, but the equivalent would be unfair competition in, in most other jurisdictions. So in Hong Kong, basically, in order to constitute passing off, we must be able to prove that the owner has reputation and goodwill in Hong Kong, which is not very difficult. Um, we must prove that there is a misrepresentation leading to confusion. The misrepresentation doesn't have to be overt. You don't have to come out and say, oh, this is actually, you know, the genuine product. You don't actually have to say that. As long as whatever you're doing misleads people into believing, you know, that it is connected with the owner or authorized by the owner, that would already do. And then the third requirement is that the owner must suffer damage, and that's not difficult to, to show, right? So examples of some misrepresentation would be that, you know, the retailer or the person selling the product has a relationship with the owner. So, for example, they are authorized distributor of the product, which in the parallel import um, scenario, that, that would be false. It would be a misrepresentation if they're, trying, if they're saying that. Um, or it could be a misrepresentation if they make people believe that it is an authorized product, uh, for example, covered by warranty. Um, it's authorized to be sold in Hong Kong. It's an official product sold in Hong Kong. Um, it could also be a misrepresentation if you say that, if you make people believe that the product, the quality of the product is exactly the same as the genuine official one sold, for example, in the shops. And, and on the passing off ground, there actually was a case in Hong Kong, um, taken by Pringles of Scotland, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. It's quite a well-known um, brand. And basically the defendant in that case bought Pringles goods through the UK warehouse. And then most of these products have minor, um, sorry, there's a typo there, it's not defenses, they're minor defects to the products, or they are outdated models. And, and this is very common in the fashion industry. People buy, um, you know, uh, last year's lines or, uh, or, you know, seconds and clothing with defects, and then they sell it on a, you know, piecemeal basis. And then the owner took action against the defendant, and passing off was established in that case. Um, because the court felt that, you know, the defendant actually made a misrepresentation that they are actually authorized or connected to the plaintiff. They are authorized dealer of the plaintiff. And then they are misrepresenting that the products that they're selling are of equivalent quality to those sold in the plaintiff's shops and that they are the newest um, styles of the clothing when they are not. And so in that case, the owner succeeded in, you know, stopping their loan put on, on this basis. Um, I mean, obviously, this is very useful for owners. However, you know, retailers are very smart as well. Nowadays, when I go, you know, into shops which sells parallel imports, they often make it quite clear that these are not, you know, official products, and you, it might not be covered by warranties, um, et cetera. So very often, it is quite clear that these are not the official authorized, you know, products for Hong Kong. So if there is no misrepresentation, you wouldn't be able to rely on, on the passing off grounds. 
So moving on, um, just to some tips and preventative measures that owners can take. Um, we've gone into great details with some of our clients to, you know, re you know to think of ways that we can prevent this. Um, obviously, one of the, the major ways that you can, uh, an owner can, you know, actions that they could take to to stop this is contractual prohibition. Um, so if you have very clear provisions in the agreements with manufacturers or distributors prohibiting them from not just selling themselves, but selling to people that they think would be selling outside of the country. So, for example, if someone approached them um, to, to buy products in bulk, and then they know that these people, or they have reason to believe that these people will be selling outside of the territory that the manufacturer or the distributor is authorized to sell, then you could catch them on the, con on the contract. So you could take action against your manufacturer or distributor. Um, it's also interesting because sometimes you would see on packaging, particularly, for example, CDs or music or films, they would say not to sell outside of certain countries. Because when you have these specific provisions um, on the packaging or um, uh, et cetera, you could arguably say that it's a breach of contractual terms if you then go on to sell it in other countries. Um, and in fact, there's a recent case in, in the UK which says, which decided that free testers and samples which are marked tester or not for sale are considered not put on the market with the consent of the owner. So, you know, um, under this case, in Hong Kong, you can at least now say that testers and um, samples which are marked not for sale would not come under the exception that I just described under trademark law, so they, wouldn't, they would be considered infringement of trademark. Um, and another uh, uh, tip that we, or, or preventative measures that I've talked to with clients is uh, changing the conditions of goods. So as I mentioned just now, you know, a lot of times you can tell where the products are from by looking at the serial number or the barcode or whatever, and what parallel importers do is that they scratch it off. So for example, one of our cosmetics clients had that problem, right? Their products are, are being parallel imported, and then they couldn't figure out who was, who sold, you know, where they came from because the barcode um, or the serial number was scratched off. But it was scratched off on the on the box outside box itself, and it was a minor, small thing. So we couldn't really argue that the conditions of the goods have been impaired. So what we decided to do is to put the serial number inside, you know, for example, the jar. So if you open the jar and, sort of, for example, you put it in the top, so in order for people to scratch it off, they would actually have to open the jar of cream and then have to scratch it off. And then if you do that, then there would be a much stronger case to argue that the conditions of the goods would be impaired or it's detrimental because you would have actually had to physically open the jar and expose the cream or something and then, you know, to scratch it off. So um, so the way we design the products uh, would would be able to help us argue that the conditions of goods have been changed if, you know, they scratch out the barcode or serial number. So other ways uh, to prevent is, of course, as I mentioned just now, we need to have an exclusive manufacturing license agreement or exclusive distribution agreement um, because this is a condition in order for us to, uh, for the owners to be able to, you know, make use of the copyright provisions. Um, then going on, vigilant monitoring is very important. Um, as I mentioned before, very often if you send a cease and desist letter, the traders will stop, you know, because they can't be bothered to argue with you. They don't want to get into litigation. So if you, you know, are vigilant in monitoring and you, if you send these cease and desist letters, very often they are, they are effective. Um, and finally, there's another, you know, thing that people could do is to publish public notices or advertisement to warn customers um, against buying parallel imports, um, you could warn them to say that, you know, these are our products are all, always sold under very strict conditions, and parallel imported, you know, we cannot guarantee that parallel imported goods are sold under the same conditions, so if you buy them, you might not, you know, they might uh, not have the same effect, um, they might, you know, something might have gone wrong, wrong with them, and then you could warn them that there could be no warranty if you buy parallel imported goods, so that is also quite effective in um, deterring at least consumers from buying parallel imported products. Um, and obviously, finally, one thing that we, I didn't say here, but we often do use to combat parallel imports is under the labeling and safety laws in Hong Kong, because obviously goods sold in Hong Kong are, uh, have to comply with these labeling laws, and very often parallel imported products don't comply with that. So that's another area that we could, um, you know, we could rely on. Um, anyways, I, I think I am coming to the end of my presentation, so uh, if there's any questions, I would be very happy to answer them. And thank you, Charmaine. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 to withdraw your question. Press star 2. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1. Just for anybody who's listening to the audio recording, 
Uh, Charmaine said that she'd be willing to take questions at her email address, which is listed here on the last page. Also, this audio recording will be posted to the um, International Trade Administration's StopFakes.gov website, S-T-O-P-S-A-K-E-S dot G-O-V. Anyways, I, I, I do know that it's very, very complicated, so um, if you think of other questions later on or at any point, feel free to um, contact me. I have a hypothetical you may not be able to answer this, Charmaine. What if you were a cosmetics company and you had sent out a cease and desist letter um, but it sounded that the the, uh, the seller just ignored them. What would your next step be? Well, that's exactly what happened to some of my clients. Um, as, I, as I mentioned just now, in Hong Kong, it's very, very uh, common. There are a lot of very large, actually, listed companies that all they do, you know, is selling um, parallel imported cosmetics. So it's uh, sorry, parallel imported cosmetics. So it's a big problem in Hong Kong, and some of my clients are cosmetic brand owners, and they have done that. Um, obviously, if you send a cease and desist letter and they ignore it, then you really need to go in to see whether we could take action under you know one of those um, areas of laws that I mentioned just now. Um, in our case, uh, that I one of the cases that I advised on, um, as I mentioned, they did scratch off the barcodes, and we weren't able to you know show that the condition of good time and impaired. But what we did do is that we sent investigators to go in and to see if they made any misrepresentations, and indeed they did, right? They actually told um, consumers that these goods, the goods were authorized, um, and then they said that, well, some of the goods were actually only meant to be used in salons and under, you know, uh, uh, supervision by experienced, uh, you know, beauticians or whatever, and they were selling these products as well. So in, in the end, the client did you know, uh, well, consider all these different ways, and then they were, they were changing the packaging as well. So um, at the end, I mean, we did write that, and then we did do um, notices to to uh, public, warning them against these things. Um, but in the end, the client did not decide to take legal action against them because, you know, as I mentioned, the air, the law is actually quite um, unclear, or there are lots of defenses under the law, so it's not a straightforward action. So the client, in the end, did not um, take action against the, uh, the parallel importers, but they do did take a lot of these different other measures to try to deter people from buying the parallel imported pro uh, products. Okay, so I guess um, the rights owners need to confer with a lawyer who's admitted in Hong Kong. That's right, because I think every situation is different. There are some cases where it's very clear that it is, you know, in breach of the law, um, like the Pringles case, where people have made express misrepresentations, or um, where the goods have clearly deteriorated. For example, they're clearly rejects, and um, you know, they're not authorized by the by the um, uh, trademark owner. Then those are very straightforward cases that if the client you know, if the other side doesn't respond to a cease and desist letter, the client can definitely take legal action in court against them. Um, obviously, there are other considerations such as cost and time involved, et cetera, which are always, you know, a deterrent. But, you know, but from a strict legal perspective, there, there would be a legal case. There is a question from the phones. The question is from Charles Wall. Your line is open. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, Charles Wall from the Department of Commerce, uh, the United States Department of Commerce, and I'm just wondering, um, do you ever see Hong Kong Customs uh, pursuing criminal cases, or I guess the, um, uh, the Ministry of Justice, or, or is this pretty much a civil action type of thing? Well, I, I, I have like never... There are some strong restrictions or limitations on the ability to bring criminal cases. Yeah, well, we have never seen a case uh, brought by customs or, you know, government authorities against parallel imports precisely because it is such a gray area of law. Because, as you know, I mean, in order to take criminal action against uh, uh, someone, you have to, you know, the hurdle is very, very high. It, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So the onus that you have to prove is very, very high. And so, as you can see from the presentation, there are a lot of um, – Exception. There are a lot of, uh, you know, defenses. There are a lot of 
things that people, uh, the defendant or, you know, the accused can raise to try to muddle up the case or to try to raise a defense. And in Hong Kong, customs very rarely take action unless it's a very, very straightforward, very, very clear-cut case because, first of all, um, there's manpower shortage, right? Second of all, because the onus is so high, you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt and you have to prove that the accused knows they have knowledge, they have the required knowledge that this is an infringing copy or this is in breach of the law. Um, if you don't, then it's very easy for their case to fail. And obviously, they don't want to um, spend the manpower or they want, don't want to pursue cases where, you know, they don't have very, they, where they don't feel that they have a very strong case. So our experience is that if you go to customs and ask them to assist um, on a parallel import case, they would be very, very reluctant to do so because, you know, because there's so many exceptions and so many defenses against, you know, such accusations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions for Charmaine? Uh, another did just come in. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, many of our, uh, I'm in a cosmetics company, and um, there are some possibly domestic um, uh, customers that are selling um, products into third-party Amazon-like um, uh, organizations uh, in Hong Kong, and they then uh, send uh, into all different countries, uh, 70 countries or so, products of ours. Um, they sometimes say that this is from uh, a legitimate um, distributor, but this is obviously a parallel uh, import. Um, what can be done? We do have an exclusive uh, distribution company in Hong Kong. Right. So these are websites based in Hong Kong? Yes. Well, they're, right. yes, they're, they're, their shipping is based in Hong Kong. They have many domain names. Uh, the main name is, I believe, registered in Hong Kong. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously, with, with selling on the Internet, it becomes even more complicated because um, just because they have a website doesn't necessarily mean that they are, you know, selling in Hong Kong. So, um, well, I mean, the good thing is... they are exporting. Uh, they're, they're, they're sending all packages from Hong Kong. Right. So the parallel provisions that we're talking about is importing into Hong Kong, right? So but if, if we can prove that they also sell to Hong Kong or they also, they also have Hong Kong customers, then first of all, from the Hong Kong perspective, we would have jurisdiction to do something uh, about it because they are selling in Hong Kong or to Hong Kong customers, mm -hmm. right? So And if they do, then again, you know, depending on what their website looks like, because there are, um, there are lots of things that we could, you know, try to argue on. For example, I mean, today's presentation is very, very short, so I don't have to, you know, I don't have enough time to go into details, but sometimes if the way they present the products um, makes people believe that they are an official website, right, because they use your logo in a very prominent way, they right. show, you know, you know, the way they, sh yeah. they, the way they design the website makes people feel that they are an authorized distributor, uh, then, you know, you would have a case under passing off to say that they are misrepresenting people and mislead into believing that they're an authorized dealer, right? Yes. Um, so you can see that some other websites, they're very clever because they no longer use your logos. They only say, yes. you know, the, the brand name, for example, just plainly Chanel or plainly, you know, uh, Lancome or something like that. But they don't go on to show your logos or to make a big deal, you know, or to design their websites with other people's logo to make them look like they're official. So those ones are much more difficult to take action against, right? Yeah. So if, but if they do, you know, if, these are uh, so, photographs, so, or logos, and so forth. Well, actually, interestingly, with photographs, you can actually stop them from using your photographs because they, you know, the photograph itself is protected by copyright. Yes, yes, I can and do that on eBay and Amazon, but I, oh, exactly, eBay, but, I but it doesn't. I mean, you can stop you can stop them from putting the photograph, but you can't stop them from selling the product itself. Mm -hmm. Right, unless you can show that again that you know the the quality has deteriorated, mm -hmm. or you can show that. As I said, the selling of that product is in breach of an exclusive uh, distributor agreement, or it is, uh, you know, it would be an, the manufacturing of that product in Hong Kong would be um, infringement, which means that you have an exclusive manufacturing agreement in Hong Kong, so therefore, you know, there would be infringement or something like that. So we need to be able to go and see what kind of agreements you have in place to see whether we could utilize the, the copyright provision. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, okay. And there are no questions at this time. Well, Charmaine, I really want to thank you for going over such a complicated area of law and then also giving your very practical um, experience on, on how to uh, combat these kind of infringers. Um, if anyone has any further questions for Ms. Ku, she can be reached um, um, at, her, at her law firm, um, and it's uh, C-H-A-R-M-A-I-N-E dot K-O-O at B-E-A-C-O-N-S dot C-O-M dot H-K. Also, the audio recording of this presentation will be posted to stopfakes.gov in about three to four days. And if you would like to listen again to, to the presentation um, and then at, and, and send Ms. Ku any questions at that time, she said that she'd be happy to, to receive them. Thank you, Janice. Again, so thank you again for, for, today's, um, for your, today's presentation, and we look forward to... Um, you attending the next presentation um, is on a Chinese website, the top, uh, the top eight IP mistakes that people make, um, and that will be next month and posted again to stopfakes.gov. Good evening from Washington, D.C.